Okay. Uh, right, guys. Uh, as I've predicted, uh, not too many people around because, uh, you know, it's the last couple lectures of the semester. Uh, to get started here, uh, hopefully you all remember your course project is due a week from today. I believe the, the due date for the presentation and the write-up are well, we shifted one day from each other. I think the write-up is one day after the presentation? Question mark? Same day. Oh, even better. Good. That's for your convenience so you can remember. So your, 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 your presentation and, and your write-up are due the same day. Um, might I suggest starting on them early so you don't have a rushed uh, day before. Uh, many of you guys came to my office hours with different questions about your project, and, and that's great. If you didn't, I'm going to assume you're on track and doing well. Um, I'm traveling for a few days. I'll be back for our next class. But that means the email response time is a little bit slow, which is usually what professors do close to project deadlines anyway. Uh, so that, that works out. Uh, any questions about that? Cool. And of course, the other thing I'm supposed to remind you on behalf of the university is you're invited to fill out the course feedback form. Um, feedback for courses always ends up being kind of bimodal in a funny way because it's always the unhappy students and the happy students. Um, but really, uh, your feedback is, is, is useful and, and uh, is, is used to evaluate your instructors in lots of different ways. And that includes both your TA and myself uh, and, and future versions of this class. You know, of course, we welcome you to say whatever you're going to say. Cool. <laughs> All right, so uh, with that, uh, today we're going to continue talking about consistent maps. Uh, and then I borrowed some slides from my colleague down the hallway on this uh, cycle gam business so I can do a little bit better job of it than we did uh, last time. Uh, and then in our next lecture, it's a bit of a choose your own adventure, and I need to judge from you guys whether you're going to show up. Um, so relative to previous times I've taught this course, this year had fewer snow days. <laughs> and the disappointing corollary for your lazy instructor is that there's one empty class period. Uh, and so I am uh, happy to prepare a lecture for Tuesday, but only with the agreement that you guys show up. Uh, and so anyway, think a little bit during class about what topic you'd want to learn about. Uh, I can guess some predictable ones in a class like this. Um, and I'm happy to prepare it, uh, but only if there's more than like two people in the room. Cool. Okay, so uh, remember uh, our, our basic setup uh, that we started, I guess, two lectures ago and, and spent all of our last lecture talking about. It was that we have a lot of different shapes, humans in different poses or brains or whatever, uh, and we have some tools that can construct mappings in between any pair of them, right? So it's like a per roughly a permutation of the points on one object onto the points of another, although that, that permutation business is a little bit suspect. Yeah, we talked about that when we mentioned functional maps. Uh, and the question was, how do we make these things consistent? Namely, you know, if I map from one person to another person to a third person and back, um, oftentimes those maps don't compose to the identity, right? And sort of in the absence of any explanation, we kind of think that they should. Um, and again, there's like this kind of funny philosophical question, like, well, maybe they shouldn't. Maybe the space of maps has uh, curvature, but I, I don't really know the right frame of, of mind to think about that. And um, this is like we just and I discussed a little bit, and I don't think we had an intelligent conclusion beyond, like, this is hard to think about. Um, but in any event, uh, today we're going to cover one of the nice, uh, sort of more mathematically justified uh, methods for, for consistent mapping that we suggested at the end of our last lecture, and we're going to dive into the details of at least how you get to the relaxation today. Uh, we're not going to prove the statistical result that this is accompanied with, because that's outside of the scope of the set of crazy inequalities that we know how to do in this course. Uh, but I'll refer, I'll, we'll, we'll talk about a little bit what it says about these, these problems and, and how to read it. Okay, um, so our basic setup here is that we're thinking of maps like permutation matrices today. Uh, and we all know that this is a lie, right? Like that there's no reason why every shape in the world has like exactly 275 points. But, uh, you know, you can do some reasonable kind of farthest point sampling and, and maybe, like, somehow, I th the way that I view this is like, there are a lot of problem in correspondence and choosing the right number of points per shape probably isn't the one that you're concerned with if you're dealing with consistency. Uh, that there's enough stuff even if you, if you make this, this assumption. Cool. And so, is, assuming that our, our, our objects are all kind of roughly sampled the same way and with the same number of points, then a map becomes just a permutation uh, matrix, okay? Uh, and so this is just like a matrix that takes the points on one object and reorders them to be points on another. Cool with the setup? Cool. And so, uh, and right, of course, the inverse of, of a permutation matrix is transpose, which is kind of nice because transpose is algebraically a lot easier to work with. Okay. Uh, right. Um, one uh, side note, uh, if, if, if I look at the set of maps, 
or the set of permutations rather, and I, I sum all of the rows uh, and I look at the value I get, right? I'm always going to get one, right? Because every single row of a permutation matrix has a single one in it. And every single column of a permutation also has a single one in it. That space is called the doubly stochastic matrices, right? Can anybody guess what the singly stochastic matrices would be? Those ones with prescribed row sums, but nothing about the columns. Right, so like the matrix where every single row is 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 would be singly stochastic. Uh, but in any event, um, what I claim is doubly stochastic plus binary equals permutation. Does that make sense? Uh, and so roughly, of, of course, we're, we're going to be talking about convex relaxation. Uh, how, can we, how, how are we going to deal with that? We're just going to drop that, that binary constraint, okay? By the way, I think typically when people talk about doubly stochastic, the rows and columns sum to one, and also the matrix is non-negative, I guess, is, is what I forgot to, to mention. Yeah. Cool. Any questions? You better watch out, because I'm going to try and do calculations today, so there's like high likelihood of error here. Um, okay. So, uh, right. So, so the basic setup is we have n different shapes, each of which has m points, right? So I can make this giant matrix, which is nm by nm, which contains all of the maps of everything on everything else. Right? And like we talked about last time, the diagonal of that matrix is roughly a bunch of identities, which makes a lot of sense, because those are the self-maps. Uh, and, and that map has some, some low rank structure. Uh, by the way, what is the size of each map here, just for sanity check? M by M, okay? Uh, and then how many blocks are there? N, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. And so this is the, the notation that we're going to use. Uh, we're going to have, and I'm going to write a lot of this on the board in a bit because it's going to be easier to keep track of. So we're going to think of this matrix with all of the possible maps as x. Okay? Uh, and there's one confusing point of notation, which I don't agree with this paper, but I'm going to follow the paper because otherwise my dyslexia is going to throw everything off here. Um, which is that I'm going to say that phi i j goes from shape i to shape j, okay? And, and similarly, uh, x, i, j, we can think of like, right, because remember that matrices input and output, then so the input goes on the right. This is where things are going to get really annoying. Yeah, so x, i, j, we're going to say comes from shape i and goes to shape j. So what goes on the right-hand side? Shape i, and what comes out is an ordering in shape j. <laughs> Okay? There's no good notation for this. This is like why a category theory is annoying in like one box. Okay? Um, but we're going to leave this box here and I'm going to refer to it a lot because I'm going to keep getting it backward. And you guys should look at my indices a lot because there's a high likelihood that they, they'll, they'll flip. Okay? And in fact, I noticed when I was reading this paper that there's, there's some, some typos. Okay. Um, so that's our, our basic setup. And so this notation here is saying what? So these are like the maps from I to J. And this is just saying that it's really a symmetric matrix, right? So if I know the upper triangle, I know, I know the lower one too. Cool. So that's our, our basic setup. Uh, and so this is a block doubly stochastic matrix. Or I, actually, I guess the better way to phrase this is a matrix with doubly stochastic blocks, right? Uh, and the larger guy is, is, is symmetric uh, uh, and so on. And, and by the way, let's, let's, let's uh, keep track. I see your, your hand there. Um, so we have, I'm going to just keep up track of all of our data here. N objects and M points. Uh, yeah, your question? That's a good question. So typically, so for this problem, we're going to solve a giant semi-definite program. So M is almost certainly smaller than the size of the meshes because this is, this is going to be an expensive optimization. So typically what you do is you do like a farthest point sample. So you randomly choose one point, and then you choose the point farthest away from that guy, and then the point that's farthest away from those two, and you, you do that m times. And that gives you some sampling with some guarantees that is nicely distributed on the surface. It's a good question. Um, essentially what's hiding here, it's only a permutation if, those, if that sampling procedure itself was consistent. And that is a thing people have not thought about carefully. Um, there's probably some fun things to be done there, and it's like suspiciously close to your TA's research. Um, but I, I keep trying to push him into thinking about consistent maps, and he doesn't want to, so, you know, I give up. 
All right. Um, <laughs> all right. So let's uh, so let's think about a, a, a map of a few seconds. So we have n objects. We have m points. So what? And remember that our, our giant matrix X he is in zero one, right? Because he's binary. Uh, the n m by n m thing. Okay. We're just going to collect all of our facts about things, right? We know that the diag that was supposed to say diagonal. Um, I kind of get distracted. Uh, the diagonal uh, blocks of X are all I's, yeah? And just to be clear, those are M by M blocks, right? Um, okay. What is the rank of this, 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 this dude? It was clearly bigger than M, because I have an M by M block sitting in there that's the identity. Assuming that my mapping matrix is completely consistent, what is the rank? We talked about this last time. So let's, uh, let's, uh, let's, let's do some thinking. Oh, that's sad, we talked about it. Okay, um, so here's our, here's our matrix, right? Um, and let's say that we're mapping between birds. So we have big bird and a toucan and a cocktail and whatever these things are. Yeah? Uh, and we can, we can put them all in correspondence with one another. Yeah, so that's n squared maps. But secretly, if, uh, if, if all of my mappings are consistent, remember this like, argument about spanning trees? Like, I don't really need all of my maps, right? I just need to map everything to the er bird <laughs> and then back out, right? So in other words, if I know one block row of my matrix, right? So that's the map from shape one to everything else, then I actually know the whole thing. How big is one block? M by MN. So what is the rank of my matrix? M. Yeah. Right. And this is the annoying... Well, so that's the thing, actually. So we talked about uh, angular synchronization. I'm sorry, I'm allergic to chalk, and this is going to be a problem today. We talked about angular synchronization, which is this idea of taking a bunch of rotation angles and kind of making them agree, remember? And there, we wrote it down as a semi-definite program with this rank 1 constraint. Right? And then what did we do? We dropped the rank 1 constraint, and what was left was something convex we could solve. Remember, that was a couple of lectures ago. And somehow, we're doing something quite similar. Right? In some sense, this is a, a, a synchronization problem. Like some people call this permutation synchronization, which is nice. It's got like a somehow phonetically pleasing ring to it. Um, one of the really surprising facts is what we're about to prove is that the hard part there is actually not the rank constraint. Uh, and this is, this is like not obvious at all in these problems. Because typically, whenever anybody says S2P, like the first thing you say is, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah rank, rank one solution, and that, that'll, you know, whatever, rank M. But that actually turns out you can drop, and your problem will not change. What we're going to prove is annoying is the binary constraint. <laughs> Um, and this is, this is rare. I actually don't know of that many problems that, that look like this. And so it's, it's worth uh, highlighting and proving. Um, and it's hiding in this like, lemma in an SGP paper, which is like, not the typical place you look for, for like, really super prof profound stuff. Uh, and, and so like, there's something, something really cool going on here. Right? And so you know, the initial fact that we think is going to be the challenging one, and certainly the one that makes this problem look like uh, synchronization problem is the fact that X is low rank, right? Like N is potentially quite large here. In fact, you kind of want N to be big, right? Because when N is big, you have a lot of maths to kind of work with. Um, but that's actually not the problem. Uh, the problem is going to be just the binary part. And that's what we're going to prove now, <laughs> I hope. So this is, this is going to be about, I think, the heaviest proof we have in the last couple of weeks of this course, um, which is okay, because we're all grown up, so we've been doing math all semester. Um, okay, so that definition is a little tiny, so let's, uh, let's, let's replicate it here. Um, so, <sighs> this is where this notation is going to be super fun, okay? So, this is, uh, our definition is, what does it mean to be uh, consistent? Right, so I have a bunch of maps, phi ij, which go from si to sj. We know that that's abstracted using one of these permutation matrices. Okay, um, so the, the definition that's used in this paper, um, which actually, it turns out, uh, with under, under some weak assumptions, is, is the most general one, um, says the following. Uh, it says that there are sort of three conditions you have to satisfy. First of all, 
What is the map from a shape to itself? Identity. Good. This is actually debatable, by the way. I mean, you could have a map that flips left to right and, and argue that that's perfectly fine, right? Um, but I think the way you get around that is you like duplicate your shape in your, your collection. Um, okay. Thing two is, let's say that I want to go from I to J and then from J to I. So we're going to do two steps. Okay, so from I to J is like that. From J to I is like that. And this thing is also the identity. Yeah? You can see why this notation is super clunky, because like, your matrix multiply brain wants to eliminate the, the I's, but this is actually the map from I to itself. Yeah? I'm just going to keep whining about this. Okay, uh, and then finally, we're going to do this for three cycles. <laughs> So, so hold on to your something or other. So we want to go from I to J, from J to K, and then from K to I. Okay, so I to J, J to K. If you say it out loud, it's not so bad, but then you read it and it's scary. And then K to I, like that, equals identity. It would be nice if there were notation where these things matched up, but it just doesn't, it doesn't work out. Okay? So... Uh, and they claim, they say, this is what we're going to call consistent. It's just these three things. There's an obvious question to ask here, which is, okay, but like, what about cycles of length four? Um, it turns out under weak assumptions on a collection of maps, as long as you have all n squared of them, these are actually sufficient. Um, that is a bit of a tricky uh, property to prove. It kind of involves like inserting things using this property and removing them in the right way. Um, and I refer you to the paper we mentioned last time. Remember we talked about this, this paper where you look at three cycles and you identify cycles with only one bad map? Hiding in there is a lemma that proves that. So we're, we're going to skip that today and maybe... The proof looks a little annoying, but I'll, I'll, I'll look back and, and if it's not too bad, maybe we'll do it next time. Okay, but, but if, if nothing else, we can certainly say that this is necessary to be uh, c consistent. And under some weak assumptions, it's, it goes both ways. Okay? All right, so that's our definition. Ugh. So now we're going to prove like this ridiculously surprising theorem, which is on the screen here, um, which sh uh, says that there are actually three different assumptions on your pairwise mapping matrix, this big X thing. By the way, when we use capital Phi, this is going to like refer to the collection of maps induced by the X's. I'm going to keep you on your toes today with terrible notation. Um, and, and, and these, the, these three con conditions are actually the same, assuming some structure on that ma mapping matrix X, namely that the diagonal is all uh, identities, okay, and that it's symmetric. Okay? Uh, and the first is that your set of maps is cycle consistent. That's according to this definition here. So there should be cycle in front of there. Uh, whatever. The second is that it's low rank. We've already sort of shown this. We'll, we'll double check it in a second. And the third one... And this is what's like stupidly, ridiculously surprising, is that this, ma this matrix is semi-definite. So as, as long as you have a binary matrix that satisfies symmetry, that the diagonal is block, uh, uh, and that it's block doubly stochastic, those are all easy constraints except for the binary one to enforce, then semi-definiteness is actually sufficient to show cycle consistency. You don't even have to know that it's low rank. This equivalence between two and three is super profound and like never happens <laughs> in STP. This is a very lucky scenario. Okay, um, and so, so we'll, we'll, we'll go about proving this. The proof is the tiniest bit obtuse and actually I would love for you guys to think about, there's, there's probably some intuition that I'm missing uh, for, for the initial lemma that we'll prove. We'll see that the proof is not so difficult beyond one really strange lemma. Uh, uh, but I wish I had a good frame of mind for like who thought of proving this little lemma and actually I don't so so let's state that lemma now <laughs> and it's very and, and the lemma itself is easy to prove it's just like a weird fun fact <laughs> okay and that is uh, as follows uh, so suppose we have some x some number x so we don't know x yet and then I'm going to state two equivalent conditions one is I'm going to make a matrix, which is 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, x, 1, x, 1. I warned you this is a weird theorem. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to say that this matrix is semi-definite, meaning that all of its eigenvalues are positive, or non-negative at least. Okay? What is this condition going to be equivalent to? Any guesses? 
there's no reason why you should be able to guess this. I wish I could guess this, but I actually don't have a great intuition for where this lemma comes from. It's easy to prove, but it's hard to... It's actually that x equals 1. <laughs> okay? First of all, this direction is easy. <laughs> okay? Um, so, so, okay, so let's write our proof. So first of all, let's uh, do the easy direction. Um, done. Uh, now let's do the, the forward direction. Um, <laughs> Okay, and this is, this is the hard part. Um, and I, I stared at it for a long time and I was trying to think of like, is there some clever way that I can go about it? And this thing, the original paper on this topic just says like, by calculation, you can do this. And then, um, which is frustrating. And then I, I, I spent all morning looking at this thing thinking like, well, that's not, that's not so clear. Um, my colleague, Peter, who wrote this is an extremely brilliant person and I'm sure in his mind it's, it's, it's that way. Um, so, you know, following this sort of, like, Toucan Sam, like, you know, follow your nose approach here, uh, how do, what do we do if we want to prove a bound on eigenvalues? We compute the eigenvalues, yeah? Uh, so let's, let's do that, <laughs> okay? So in particular, let's do everybody's favorite calculation from college linear algebra class, right? So this is 1 minus lambda, 1, 1, 1, 1 minus lambda, x, 1, x, 1 minus lambda, yeah? I'm going to make a substitution here because I'm lazy, uh, which is I'm going to put a number p here, which I'm going to define to be 1 minus lambda, because there's like a lot of 1s in this problem. By the way, lambda greater than or equal to 0 is equivalent to what condition on p? This took me like a half an hour in my office this morning, I'm not going to lie. p less than or equal to 1. <laughs> Yep, that, that wasted a lot of my time this morning. Okay, so, uh, right, so, so in other words, this is the determinant of P11, 1PX, 1XP. Okay, you can see that this is a little easier to work with. Okay. Uh, do we have space to do one more line? Yeah, that's okay. Ow! Laugh. Who do we just laughed? What is that about? It hurts. Okay. Um, right, so this expression. Um, so let's continue to do a boring calculation. So this is p times p squared minus x squared, yeah? Uh, and then we have minus 1 times p minus x, yeah? I th you guys should stop me if I'm doing this wrong. Plus x minus p. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, good. Good, good, good. Thank you. Um, and now we can simplify this thing. Remember the, what is our unknown here? P, it's not X. Psychologically, this was, was hard for me. So the, the unknown is, is P. That, that's what we're trying to solve for. Okay? Um, and, and so this is a polynomial in P. Yeah? So the higher order term is P cubed. Um, is there any P squared term here? No? Um, so now we have the p uh, term, so there's a minus x squared, uh, a minus 1, and another minus 1, yeah? So this is like 2 plus x squared times p, uh, and then we have all the other stuff, right? So we have a plus x, a plus x, and a minus x squared. Did I do that right? No? Oh, that's wrong. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, so just plus 2x. <laughs> okay. Have I managed to make any mistakes so far? I don't think I have. I think this agrees with this. Yeah, okay. So first of all, can anybody read off a uh, solution of this polynomial? There's one that's easy to read off, and then the remaining ones are really annoying. There's like only one solution you could possibly guess here, which is p equals x. And notice that that works out, right? So you have p cubed minus p cubed, yeah? Minus 2x <laughs> plus 2x. <laughs> okay, cool. So, so uh, p uh, e equals x is a solution. Yeah? Uh, and notice, remember that all of my eigenvalues have to be uh, bigger than 0. Yeah? So in other words, or, or equivalently, these things all have to be less than or equal to 1. So, so far, we've actually already proven some bound on x, which is that x is less than or equal to 1, right, because that's one of the three eigenvalues. 
And now to continue on our super fun, tedious computation, what do we need to do? It's our favorite thing from high school algebra, which I had to Google this morning, which is polynomial long division. Yeah? I couldn't find any other way to prove this fact. I tried for quite a long time to like have some slick one-liner, and I, I just couldn't. Um, and if you put it in Mathematica, it just vomits. So I'm, I'm actually unclear how they, they prove this. Okay, so, uh, right, so let's, let's just do that for, for fun. It's a good review for everybody anyway. So, how do we do polynomial long division, huh? We got p cubed plus 0p squared. We're going to write it really big. Uh, and then we have a minus 2x plus x squared p plus 2x. Yeah? And we're trying to kill the factor that we just found, which is x, right? So p minus x. You guys remember how to do this? I, d I totally didn't. It took me a long time. Okay, so first we want to cancel the p cubed term. So what do we do? We multiply that by p squared over here, and that sits on top of the quadratic stuff. Yeah? And then we have, so we have what? p squared minus x p squared. We subtract. Cubed. Cubed. Okay. Um, yeah, that's right. Okay, so now we have xp squared, and then we have minus 2x plus x squared p plus 2x. Minus. Wait, I don't have an x here in my notes. Is this? There's no x. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I was just reading like an idiot. Yeah, yep, yep, that's fine. Okay. Guys are so quiet, but you should know by now that I make a lot of idiotic mistakes. Okay. Cool so far? So now we want to kill the xp squared. We have a p over there. Um, so we need to multiply that by xp. So that should be... Mm, wait, so that's plus... Yeah. So there's a sign mistake here. Oh, oh, my God, sorry. I uh, see my brain really wants the, uh, I really want x to be the variable, but it's p. You're absolutely right. So, <laughs> so I do uh, xp here. So I get, uh, is that right? Yeah. There's, this is, uh, we have xp squared, uh, p, I multiply by p, we get p squared, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. So <laughs> I multiply this thing by xp, then I get xp squared, um, and then I get a minus xp times x. So this is a minus x squared p, like that. Okay. So when I subtract these things, these cancel, these cancel. I'm left with minus 2p plus 2x. Ah, good. And there's order in the universe. Yeah. Um, and so what is that? That's minus, minus 2. Okay. So, for our next trick. <laughs> what do we want? Remember what we want. So let's, let's go back to our... Oh. So we have p equals x, or x equals... Ah! P equals, <laughs> what, negative B plus or minus the square root of B squared over 4AC, yeah? So what's B here? It's minus X, yeah? X plus or minus the square root of B squared, so that's X squared minus 4AC, so that's plus 8 over 2 nothing, yeah. <laughs> okay? <laughs> I warned you this is no fun at all. Uh, okay, and, and, and in particular what this implies um, is that the other two lambdas are equal to, let's say you just plug back in uh, there, um, and what you're going to get is x plus 2. Okay. So, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Right, and the, the sign changes here because remember it's, it's 1 minus x. Okay. I gotta keep just repeating it myself until I get. Okay, so remember that x is already less than or equal to 1. Yeah? We now want to show that x is greater than or equal to 1. Yeah? So how do we, how do, we do that? 
Well, remember that this number, uh, lambda, has to be greater than or equal to zero. Yeah? And one thing you can just double check is that, well, what happens when x is equal to one? This is one plus eight is nine, the square root of that is three, one plus two is three, put the minus there, <laughs> right, you get zero. So what's gonna happen if x uh, goes any bigger than one, well, then this whole number is going to become negative because this term is going to dominate, right? Uh, and so, <laughs> we're done. <laughs> so in other words, uh, x is greater than or equal to 1, which is what we needed. Yeah? Okay. So, on four boards, we managed to prove the lemma that we need. It's admittedly somewhat of an obtuse lemma. I will, I will give you that. But it's going to give us everything that we need. Now we're going to do a bunch of erasing. So is it okay if I erase? Oh, boy. We should leave the lemma there, and I'm going to erase the stuff underneath it. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, because I want to keep all the definitions here. Sorry. That's, apparently, if you teach, what, middle school, you, you go through, like, there's a course on how to manage the board in a nice way. And you don't learn that in a PhD in applied math. And this is what happens. Um, my mom went through all of this teacher's school stuff, and uh, she came to my undergrad graphics lecture, and it, I'm very self-conscious because apparently my writing in the class all like, kind of went up and, and to the diagonal. <laughs> and so now I'm very self-conscious to make sure uh, that that doesn't happen. I've done a reasonable job. Okay. Um, right, so, so now we're going to prove uh, the, the, the thing that we actually set out to prove. Uh, essentially that these things are all equivalent conditions. And we're going to find that everything is super easy except for 3 implies 2. <laughs> right? Which you can already kind of eyeball, it's going to be the annoying one, yeah? Um, okay, so first of all, um, one, 1 implies 2. So what is that saying? That's saying, if my mass are cycle consistent, then this thing is low rank. We already justified that because that's exactly the same as saying I map everything to the first row and then I map them all back out. And that's exactly the second expression. Okay? So, done. Okay. 2 implies 1. So largely this part is just notation and, and, and this is kind of annoying. So. What do we need to do to show that 2 implies 1? We need to say, I have a, a matrix where all of his blocks are permutation matrices, and I know that this matrix is low rank, and I know that the diagonal is identity, and now I need to go back and check all three of these conditions, yeah, uh, and, and show that I get what I want. Yep. Yeah? Okay. First of all, um, well, so the first condition of... Uh, uh, cycle consistency is what? The map from you to yourself is identity. That's actually just one of our three assumptions, so there's, there's nothing to check there. Okay? The second condition, uh, th this has to do with loops of, of length two, and already this is going to be kind of annoying. <laughs> yeah? So, uh, first we're going to prove one uh, kind of useful fact, which is what is the map from phi i j in this language? Remember, this is kind of like block ij of this, this outer product. So by definition, it's mapping into 1 and then back out. Remember, this is from i to j. So this is x from i to 1, and then from x from 1 to j. Yeah? So these two things are the same um, in our, our set of assumptions. Okay? So uh, what do we want to show first? We want to show that... Uh, that phi i j composed with phi j i is the identity. Okay. So phi i j composed with phi j i. So phi i j is x i j x... Ah, oops, sorry. That's x 1 j to x i 1. <laughs> okay. That's based on our assumptions, right, that everything is low rate. And then phi j i to make our matters like a little more annoying is, is exactly the opposite of that, right? So it's x1 i x j1. Okay? Now what is this product? This is exactly the diagonal of x. 
So, so we started by factoring this way, right? The first two and the second two. Now we're going to factor the middle two guys. Right? So this is x1i times xi1. This is the map from i to 1 and then from 1 to i. And by, just by assumption, this thing is the identity. Right? And now what are we left with? We're left with from 1 to j, then nothing. And then from j to 1. So what is that thing? Identity. So we're good. <laughs> uh, are you going to make me do the third one? OK, the, the third condition is exactly the same. You, 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 just, you just expand it out in terms of this expression here, and then you couple it the other way, and you're going to get a bunch of identity matrices. If you want me to write it out, it's OK. Don't make me write it out. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So the way, the full, the full phrasing of this theorem is, suppose that x has, is, is, is block doubly stochastic, symmetric, and binary, then these three conditions are equivalent. That's a great question. <laughs> Sorry, I should have written that out. Any other questions? Okay, so conditions one and two are equivalent. There we are. Proof. All right, suppose you're supposed to like... That? Okay, uh, and, 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 and I, was, I would argue that 1 and 2 being equivalent is really not surprising. And now the, the surprising one is, is 2 and 3. Okay. <sighs> All right, hold on to your something. Uh, it's actually quite short. Um, okay. So, uh, what direction do we want to do first today? Two to three, thank you. Okay, so let's, <laughs> thank you for giving me the easy one. So, two implies three. So in other words, I can write my map matrix as this product of low ring factors, and I want to show that that implies that my matrix is semi-definite. This is almost just by, by definition, but, but we, can, we can check it real quick. So what does it mean to be semi-definite? It means that I can take uh, whatever my favorite vector is, maybe z transpose times x, Z, right? So we're going to say, assume that we satisfy uh, category 2. We want to show that we satisfy category 3. Yeah. Um, but then by definition, this is uh, ah, Z transpose. Uh, by the way, I guess here, uh, I assume that I equals 1. We're just going to assume we know the first map. That's, that's, that's okay. Yeah. Um, so this is Y1 transpose Y1 Z. And as usual, we do the only thing we know how to do, which is, z, uh, not that, y1 times z transpose times y1 times z. This is equal to the norm of y1 times z squared. And that thing is equal to zero. Cool. This is like Cholesky factor or anything else. OK. So for our last trick, uh, we're going to do 3 and plus 2. <laughs> OK. And this one is the one that's like kind of magical, right? Because what you're saying is that the, all I'm going to assume is that my binary matrix is positive definite, and then I get with this block condition on it. And what I get for free is that it has the rank equal to the size of one of the blocks. Not at all obvious. OK. So here's how we're going to do it. I'm going to construct a, a very particular matrix. So here, the, this, this, this thing y1, we thought of like kind of one row of that matrix. Now I'm going to take that row and I'm going to splay it down the diagonal of a matrix instead. Okay? So in particular, I'm going to define the following uh, matrix, uh, which is equal to, uh, and essentially what I'm going to do is I'm just going to extract out the first row. So I'm going to get identity and then x12 all the way to x1. N. So the difference between this and that Y matrix is that this thing looks like identity X12, X13, with a bunch of zeros like that. Okay? This is just a convenience object. Okay? And I'm going to define in a second thing, which is essentially going to conjugate with D. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my map matrix and I'm going to make a new map matrix, x prime. I'm going to make him equal to dx d transpose. Now what do I, and notice that, by the way, when I transpose d, I've in effect just inverted d because he's diagonal except all of his blocks, which are orthogonal. Okay. And what does this matrix look like? Exactly. Well, not quite. So on the left-hand side, you're applying all of the, the, the maps from one to whatever. On the right-hand side, you're applying all the inverses, right? That's where there's the transpose there. So you, if you think about it for a sec, what you're going to end up with is a matrix that looks as follows. You're going to get identities all in the first upper arrow of this matrix, right? Uh, like that. And we'll write an expression for y in just a second. Um, and generically speaking, you're going to get a bunch of entries that look like x, oh boy, 1i, x, i, j, j, x, 1, j, transpose. I think I did that right. Yep, because this is row i, right? So this is the, first, the ith element of the, the diagonal matrix, x, 1i. This is just generically ij element of x. And then this is 1j transpose. Yeah. So notice like in the first row, what's going to happen is you're going to get a repeated one index, and that's why you get these identity matrices that come out. Cool? All right. What does this look like? It almost looks like a cycle, yeah? So we're, we're starting to be in good shape, right? That's, that's the, the sort of sneaky trick. Um, and what do we know? We, know? we know that x is positive definite, and a theorem you may remember from your linear algebra class, or one that's easy to check on paper, is that if x is positive definite, what can we say about x prime, because I wrote it in this form? It's also positive definite. Okay. This is kind of nice, because this is, a, this is a pretty nicely structured matrix, right? Like, I've got this big thing of i's hanging out here, and I just have to say something about this product. Um, and, and, and what's going to be our goal eventually uh, is to show that basically I get a bunch of little identities hiding everywhere else. We haven't shown that yet. Okay. Any ideas for, for how to proceed? So it turns out 2 by 2 is, 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 is not going to cut it. But conveniently, I, I wrote you guys a lemma over here. <laughs> Uh, which has to do with three by three matrices. And this is where this little, this, this magic trick comes in. Um, okay, so this matrix is block gigantic. <laughs> this, is a, this is a big matrix here. And what we're going to do is we're going to extract principal sub matrices of this guy. Does anybody remember what that means? That means that I, I take a tuple of indices, like one, five, and seven, and then I make it like a three by three matrix, which is like one, 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 five, one, seven, 5, 1, 5, 5, 5, 7, and so on. So I just like extract sort of an evenly spaced square inside of here. What can I say about a principal submatrix? Yeah, so it turns out if a matrix is positive semi-definite, then so are all of its principal submatrices. Do you guys know why? This is an easy proof. Let's think about it for a second. So, so let's do a quick example. So, so let's say that I have like, I don't know, um, a, B, C, I guess this is, a, uh, whatever, E, F, G, H, I, <laughs> there's a 3 by 3 matrix, and I wanted to check that the first principal submatrix, like the upper square here, is also positive definite. How could I do it? Well, I could just look at matrices that are like X1, X2, 0, X1, X2, 0, like that. Notice that, that if this is positive, right? And hence, this matrix is positive definite because secretly this number is the same as x1, x2, uh, a, b, d, e, x1, x2, yeah? So, right, so there's that. Now the question is, what do the 3 by 3 principal sub-matrices of this thing look like? I warned you today it was going to be nasty. 
So first of all, what is the diagonal? What are the diagonal elements of, of principal submatrices? Where, where do they have to come from in the original matrix? What's that? Yeah, they're still diagonal. Exactly. So like, look here. I have A, C. Here's A, and that's a C. Believe it or not. Yeah. C. <laughs> Whatever. Okay. Uh, <laughs> And similarly, like, what would be a different uh, principal submatrix? Like A, C, G, I. And notice that A and I are, the, the, are still on the diagonal. So no matter what, my principal submatrices are come, their diagonal elements come from the original matrix here. Yeah? So let's take a 3 by 3. Is it okay if I erase this little thing? Okay. In fact, yeah, whatever. Let's take a 3 by 3 principal submatrix. Principal There it is. And we know that he's semi-definite because this guy is semi-definite. And furthermore, what do we know the diagonal elements of this, this matrix? What are they going to be? They're going to be one. Right? Because uh, the diagonal of this guy is identity matrices. In particular, the diagonal of the identity matrices is one. Yeah? Okay. What is this starting to look like? <laughs> Getting closer. Yeah, we're, we're starting to fill in some elements here. Now, let's think about these elements. And in particular, let's assume that uh, my principal uh, uh, submatrix uh, includes the, from the first. OK? So in other words, Right, remember, the, so I, I can think of this as like index i, index j, index k, right? Where this is like shape i, shape j, and shape k. And then within that, I'm not going to care which of the endpoints. It's not going to matter as much. Okay? So in other words, because this is from shape i, right, the principal submatrix we're going to draw is from the first row. Like up here, this corresponds to elements of the first row. And what are those things? Identity matrices. Yeah? So what am I going to get here? One, 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 one. Yeah? So what am I left with? <laughs> Question mark. Yeah? And so in particular, this makes sh proves me, uh, with this, this proves me uh, by our lemma, <laughs> a little tired, that x equal to 1. And now we have to go back and squint and say, well, what, the, what does that tell us about our, our matrix? Well, the kind of neat thing, if you think about it, is that tells us one element of this giant guy that isn't on this arrow. Do you see that? So let's, let's, let's draw a little schematic of what's going on, because this is really hard to think about. It's really annoying. Yeah? So I have this giant matrix, and I've got a bunch of little, I can think of it like, you know, big, I don't know, what, what board game has a bunch of squares? <laughs> Minesweeper. Yeah, Minesweeper is great. So we've got this big Minesweeper. Each of these blocks is M by M, if I recall. OK? And what do I know? I know that there's like little identities sitting here. <laughs> this is the, the picture we have so far. And now, by taking a principal submatrix, <laughs> I don't know, something like that. Oh, and I know like that. Yeah. Okay, what have I done? Well, I have this is an element of my principal submatrix, and then this guy is, and this guy is. <laughs> One down. That guy. <laughs> I think my schematic works now. Sorry. So, what did I just show? I showed that these matrices, their diagonals are all one. But they're also doubly stochastic. So what are these matrices? They're identity matrices. It's the only matrices that, are, that have diagonal 1 and are doubly stochastic. But I can play this game for any of these indices. And now what I've shown is my whole matrix is just a bunch of identity matrices glued together. This is a clever proof. <laughs> okay? And it relies on this really goofy lemma that I wish I understood. OK, um, so now let's, let's unravel our proof a little bit. So, so what, did, what did we just show? We showed that the ij block of x prime is equal to the identity. 
right? And now let's unravel what that means. That means that that's equal to x1 i x i j x1 j transpose. <laughs> yeah? So now what can I do? I can isolate x i j. And what I'm going to be left with is just this low rank condition, right? That um, x i j is equal to because remember the inverse of a permutation matrix is this transpose. Uh, this thing is x one i transpose x one j, which is exactly what we wanted to prove. Done. Right, there's this Harvard professor that like signs his emails with QED. Um, what's his name? Scott Commoner. Um, went to. I know him from high school science fair. Okay, um, so this is the, the really surprising theorem. The, like, you guys, your mind should be like, Pew! even like if you step back 50 feet from this, this terrible proof that your structure just attempted, you should, you should, you should, the thing you should take away is the, the hard part about the cycle consistency problem is, I mean, think about all of the constraints we have. In order to be cycle consistent, what is sufficient is to be semi-definite, block doubly stochastic, block identity down the diagonal, Symmetric. Everything I've said so far is convex. And then one additional constraint, which is binary. That's weird, right? Because what didn't I include? Anything about the rank. And that's okay because of this lemma here. Are you guys excited? I'm excited. This is, this is, this is a cool theorem. Okay? Um, and this allows us uh, to say something about the convex hull of our, our optimization problem, because typically the annoyance of, of these convex hulls is when you have a bunch of constraints and then some rank constraint, but we just dropped that, and now we just have easy constraints, which just bounds on our variables, and, and, and it's really clear how to, how to relax those. Yeah? Um, okay, so now uh, for our final trick, before we move on to like something completely different, which is like GANs, which is like the opposite end from math to whatever. Um, <laughs> so let's say that I have a big block permutation matrix, but it's inconsistent. So I have a bunch of xij's, and they all don't agree with each other, and I want to find the closest approximation of that guy with a, uh, you know, the, the, the correct thing. Yeah? And so the correct thing here will be xij. What is this inner product counting? Yeah, so for a second. So remember that this dot product is like taking all the elements of two different permutation matrices and like superposing them and then taking their dot product and adding them together. So this is counting the number of times that two permutations agree with one another. So this is the number of correct matches. Right? That's why it's a max. I want to find the closest approximation of my original problem. So this is saying, give me the most, uh, the, the, the consistent object that agrees the most times with my input data. But what do I need to do? Well, what we just proved in our lemma is that these conditions here, these one, two, three, four, five conditions, are equivalent to being cycle consistent. And that's not obvious. It required a lot of work. Okay? What do we think we do from here? We can't solve this problem. This is, this, is, this is crazy. This is some like three set looking thing. In fact, it's very close to three set, right? Because there's like a three hiding here. Yeah? Um, right? So to make sure we can read this, by the way. So this is maximizing the number of preserved matches. We've got this binary constraint. Um, every block is a permutation. self maps with the identity. And then this crazy one, which is to show that it's the same as being low rank or cycle consistent, whatever your favorite condition is. Okay? The problem here, this is extremely non-convex. I think this is like falls into the category of totally classic, annoying binary optimization problems. So what is the convex hull of my constraints? Yeah, x is between 0 and 1, right? It's obvious that like my convex hull contains that set because it contains the 0 and the 1, so it's going to contain everything in between. Yeah? So if I relax this constraint to be x is bigger than or equal to 0 and less than or equal to 1, this is an optimization problem I can, I can solve. And it has a unique solution, uh, and, and uh, yeah, this is, this is the thing that we can actually do. Um, notice that I replaced it with x is greater than or equal to 0. Um, I don't have to do x is less than or equal to 1, because that's secretly taken care of by this constraint here. Because yeah? um, right, a positive matrix with a bunch of chunks that sum to 1, then clearly every element is less than 1. That makes sense? 
So this, this thing, by the way, do you know what this cone is called when you have semi-definite matrices whose entries are positive? You know, copositive is a whole other hot mess. This is the doubly positive cone for obvious reasons. <laughs> yeah, no, the co-positive uh, matrices, 10 second digression because you use that term and it's one of my favorite counterexamples, is the set of matrices where x transpose a x is greater than or equal to zero for all vectors x, that would be semi-definite, greater than or equal to zero. What do you think? Is it, if I give you an A, can you come up with an algorithm for verifying if A is copositive? It's not copositive, that's the dual of this step, or whatever. The answer is no, it's actually, it's NP-hard to verify whether A is in this set, which is really scary to think about because this is a convex set. Yeah? Um, people usually think like convex equals easy, and, and this is a good counterexample. However, semi-definite does equal easy, uh, and, 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 and that's what we have here. Okay, um, so what do we do in practice? We solve this thing. Um, unfortunately, we relaxed our problem, so we may not have gotten a permutation matrix. Um, so we have to round it off. There's an easy way to round um, um, your solution here, which is to take uh, your solution and now maximize the inner product with a doubly stochastic matrix per block. Uh, and what you'll end up with is necessarily a permutation because the vertices of this constraint set we already talked about are, are the permutation matrices. Uh, there's a bit of a contradiction in terms here. <laughs> so what happens if my problem didn't have exact recovery? In other words, I solved this convex problem and I didn't get a binary answer. It happens sometimes. It turns out to be rare, uh, but it does happen. And then I use this rounding step to just kind of fix the, the, the m by m blocks of, the blocks of this matrix. Well, the output won't be cycle consistent anymore, right? I just, I just, I just projected that out. Uh, and so, so the, typically I think you use these kinds of algorithms and you pray to God that you get a cycle consistent thing anyway. And when your answer isn't binary, then you say, ah, and, that, and that's the most you can say about, uh, about these kinds of techniques. But thankfully, um, there's actually a theorem, and this is uh, out of the scope of this course. Um, so there's a very small extension of the theorem that we proved here, which allows for some of the maps to be unknown. So like you have a graph that's sitting underneath the collection of shapes, and you only know uh, uh, maps along the edges of that graph. And there's a really crazy thing that happens, which you can prove that as long as a fraction of your, 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 the fraction of bad matches here is upper bounded by lambda 2, this is the second eigenvalue of the Laplace operator of that graph, you can't get away from this thing, uh, divided by 4n, remember that n is the number of objects here. So as long as you can, you can upper bound uh, your number of bad matches by this magic number, then you can prove that actually uh, when you solve this, this, this relaxed problem, you get something binary anyway. In other words, you solve this to global optimality. This is ridiculously cool, because what it means is that like, you can have noisy maths, solve a convex relaxation of your problem, and solve this really difficult problem and get the right answer. Um, by the way, uh, specifically in the case that we did where you have a fully connected graph, like basically every vertex is connected to every other one because we have a complete set of maps, um, then lambda 2 is known in closed form, you can plug it in, uh, and it, that magic number becomes 25% or 0.25. And your mind should be blown because that is a big number. Do you see what that's saying? That's saying I can compute permutations and one fourth of the time get it wrong and still recover a cycle consistent approximation. And I think this explains some of why these techniques do so well, is that they're somewhat very resilient. Like this is a cool convex relaxation, but convex problems are usually just fun toys. Like in this, in this world, actually this is a really practical result, right? It's showing that these algorithms kind of work out of the box a, a, a pretty big fraction of the time. Um, so in fact, that is a loose bound. Um, they, there are a bunch of experiments in this research paper you can go take a look at, where they kind of look at and, and like the, they flip a coin and every once in a while just put a bad match into the permutation matrix and look at the fraction of times when it works. And there's like an interesting unexplained phase transition that happens in this problem. So like there's this huge region where you get the, the, the globally optimal solution and then something crazy happens. And I think this is, remains unexplained in, in, in the literature. What is the y-axis? Ah, sorry. Uh, this is the probability of a bad match. So you see it says p false. So the idea here is that I, I flip a coin at every entry of, of, of my permutation matrix, and with that probability, I just flip it with some other guy. I guess half of that probability, because there's two things that got messed up. The color so the color uh, blue means that it recovers, red means that it didn't recover, a different color here means that 
some of the experiments it did and some it didn't. Yeah, and so there's a pretty clear line. There's probably some really cool algebraic explanation here uh, that, that like maybe Pablo Perillo in our department can figure out someday. Yeah. This is a, uh, and, and, and really this stuff works. So like here you can see a collection of humans and the colored points are matched to one another and, and I guess it's kind of hard to see on the screen, but you can trust me that these points are in the same place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, how does the like accuracy? So even if even if we're correct, we're only going to be correct up to some. Oh, the corresponding like that. Didn't quite follow, but I'm glad you feel better. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. So uh, right. So this is a really interesting result and 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 really deep one. Um, the uh, there's still one little hole that's remaining in, in this kind of work, which is where do those maps come from? Maybe it's a, a slightly broader version of your question. Uh, and, and indeed, I think, I think that's a reasonable one. That, like, this is an algorithm that a posteriori takes a collection of maps and goes back and tries to fix them. Instead, you could try to just fix your mapping algorithm to be consistent. And that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Uh, in fact, when you talk to a lot of people in medical imaging, they'll give you this goofy answer, like, oh, of course our algorithms are consistent. And the reason is that their registration algorithms just always map to some base object and then back out. And so like, yeah, of course. Um, so like these atlas-based tools are consistent. Um, there are algorithms out there that try to do the whole damn thing in one giant shot. So like I try to minimize the distortion of the map between every pair and add a constraint that the, between every triplet, the whole collection of maps I get is consistent. You can see that already this is a giant mess. Uh, and these are hard problems to solve. I mean, they're convex, but they're slow. Uh, and now you're wrapping that in quadratic assignment problem um, is extremely difficult to do. Uh, this paper and a few that, that followed up on it did, in some sense, you know, in retrospect, the obvious thing, although, you know, not obviously going in, maybe not, um, but they said, okay, remember, we convinced ourselves that a lot of these matching problems are like quadratic objective with permutation matrix constraint. Well, you could take that quadratic objective and build it into this optimization problem, right? And what you'll get is a quadratic objective plus a semi-definite constraint on the full matrix of all of the different things blocked together. And then what they propose is they say, okay, I'm going to take the outer product of that matrix in itself. I think we already talked about this a little bit. And now I have a variable which is the product of every pair of elements from every pair of matrices in my collection. Right? So this is the way that I linearize my objective by essentially taking all the quadratic terms and, and baking them into a new variable. And uh, now writing all of my constraints, if there were an equal sign here, this would be equivalent to my quadratic assignment problem. And then I relax that one and try to solve. And experimentally in this research, they show that oftentimes they, they get like a consistent low distortion set of maps. Um, but I, I don't think that the theorem that we proved here really carries over uh, to that case. So there's, there's some hard work to do. So the, the title of this paper is a bit fishy. They call it a tight relaxation. And the way that they prove it is they generate a million examples of shape collections and, and just check. Um, there's some interesting math here that remains to be done, for sure. By the way, this is like, these are open problems. We have reached the interface now of, 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 of hard geometry stuff. Yeah? So a thought before showed that um, when there are more objects, there's more um, ambiguity, I guess. Is that right? Uh, Yeah, so I think in this experiment, M is fixed. Yeah, so this is a good sign, right? So, so remember, the number of points per shape is fixed, and the number of objects is increasing. And the blue means good. <laughs> and notice as I go to the right, like I add more objects, the blue region gets bigger. So that's, that aligns with what we, what we expected, yeah. But it's a good sanity check to, to ask, yeah. Uh, well, let's see. We can look at our bound. Yeah, I guess, I guess the bound actually doesn't mention that. I don't know. I mean, these bounds are in terms of, of percent of, 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 of matches that are wrong, so they wouldn't be affected. Yeah, I don't know. I'd have to go back and look at the calculation again. It's a good question. Yeah. Any other questions I can uh, <laughs> not answer for you? Yeah. So, so these, are, these are new results, and they're, they're hard, and these are hard things to think about. Yeah, um, but, but there, there are many different directions to go. I mean, one of them is to take this relaxation, glue it into the relaxation of quadratic problems we talked about before, and have one giant thing, and have consistent octopus maps, which is what you see here. Um, this is kind of surprising. 
Um, another is to say like, okay, this is just some non-convex problem. Let's like not try and be morally justified here and just do the non-convex thing and do gradient descent. And there are a lot of algorithms out there that do that. So like this is one, it's not worth reading the abstract very closely. It's just like essentially exactly what you would expect, right? You have a bunch of these distortion energies, you add them all together, and then you have some cycle consistency, you add that in there, and you try to minimize. Uh, I have my own version of that, which is in this paper we talked about before, um, where you can throw that low rank constraint right into your problem um, and, and try and solve. Uh, okay. And for our final uh, minute or two here, uh, I thought we would, would take a look at one application. Our slide format is going to change, which, as you guys all know, means I stole it from someone else. Um, but actually, there's a, just a, there's a, a very popular and modern application of this stuff, um, which is quite different from what you guys just saw on the board here, um, but I think extremely popular in the computer vision literature. Just out of curiosity, how many of you guys have seen this before? I know several of you have. Yeah. Um, so you probably know this work better than I do. In fact, it was largely done by a, a postdoc, uh, Jun Yan, who's here at, at MIT. So I took his slides, butchered them, and, and will explain it poorly. Um, but my point here is, is not to give the, the details of his deep network, but rather just to see how this cycle consistency idea doesn't just apply to like mapping octopi to each other, but also in these high dimensional statistical problems too. Um, so here, uh, the problem you want is your input data is a horse running around, and your output data is in some sense a giraffe, um, something a little bit uh, surprising, or well, sorry, this has happened a number of times. <laughs> yeah, actually, right, and and a giraffe would be much more challenging because the geometry uh, would not be the same. Uh, but in any event, uh, something a little bit surprising about this video, which I don't think is actually explored in this work, is that it's temporally coherent, which caught me by surprise because um, I think he just applies his his filter to every frame independently. Uh, okay, so. Uh, right, and, and there are a bunch of people here, none of whom are, are me, so I'll, I'll try my best to explain what's going on here. Um, okay, so the basic idea is that for a long time, there, there are all these different generative modeling tools that, that happen in machine learning. And the, the typical setup is, is something that actually dates back to the computer graphics literature. Uh, in fact, there's a gentleman, Aaron Hertzman, um, who now is one of, the, I think, the deep learning graphics generative stuff uh, gurus, who back in the day was very famous for being one of the early developers of non-photorealistic rendering, like made making a rendering tool that makes stuff look painted and that kind of stuff. Uh, and somehow his interests actually haven't drifted that far, although the technology has changed quite a bit. Like it used to be you kind of talk to artists and you learn about paint strokes. These days you train a deep network and, and that's your artist. Um, but in any event, a, a lot of these tools uh, follow what, what dates back to Hertzman's work, um, which is this idea of, of what they call image analogies. Right? So like maybe I'm trying to learn how to sketch something, and so my input data is like a bunch of objects and their sketches. Right? So I have a bunch of like cats, and for every cat, I have one of our grad students sit down and sketch this, this, this cat, and now I have this big kind of labeled, uh, set of labeled pairs. Um, and and <laughs> you might laugh, but actually that is r roughly how, how research went in, in that area for a long time. Um, which is why I was very glad not to, to, to do it. Um, and, and, and there's some really impressive results, right? I mean, you can like try and do different in-painting tasks where like maybe you have, you know, you want to draw a street and instead you just kind of paint regions like I want this to be street and this to be lamp and then it synthesizes stuff and, and you can do remarkably well. Um, the problem is of course I want to make a horse into a giraffe or a zebra as it were. Um, there are very few horse zebra pairs out there that I can learn from. Yeah, and it would be very expensive to hire an artist to sit there and, and, and paint the zebra analogy of a horse. Right? And so the question was, can you still learn how to do these kinds of uh, things, uh, even though you don't have a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, uh, the two sets that you're trying to map to, to each other? Yeah? Uh, and, and so that's this idea of, of learning from unpaired data. That is relatively easy to go on Google Images and download a million horses and a million giraffes, but it's, it's quite difficult to download them in correspondence. Okay, and, and, and so that's, that's what's solved by this cycle again, and of course, because it's in the modern computer vision literature, about 800 papers that go after it. But we'll, we'll talk about the original one. So, for those of you who are not familiar with these generative adversarial network ideas here, um, the idea is, uh, as I understand it, I want to train a neural network to draw horses. <laughs> yeah? um, this has failed on me, I can't draw anything. But, but that aside, the way that you're going to do it is this kind of interesting adversarial idea, where you generate this object which is just generating images of horses. And then you have this background data set, which is actual images of horses. And now you're going to train a second piece of machine learning uh, machinery whose job it is is to distinguish between the stuff that you drew and the stuff in your data set. Does that make sense? 
So when have you done well? You've done well if that second guy fails. Right? And that's why it's called an adversarial network. It's kind of like a game theory thing going on here. I learn how to draw, it learns how to discriminate, I learn how to draw, it learns how to discriminate, we go back and forth, and then I've done well when he's basically at 50%. He can't tell the difference between human-generated drafts and, and computer-generated zeros. Okay? All right, so, uh, right. so, so that's the basic uh, thing you want to do, but of course you don't have uh, input-output pairs uh, in these kinds of problems. Right? So, so the basic setup here is you have this generator, which is making drafts, you have a discriminator, in the technical sense only. Although actually I've seen some recent applications of this stuff that lead me to believe <laughs> there's some fishy things that go on here. Um, that's trying to distinguish between your data and the real data. And, and there's a problem, which is that, of course, if I map this thing to zebras, these are kind of an analogy to each other, the animals are in the same place. But this object also looks like an object in your zebra data set. <laughs> right? And it had nothing to do with your input data. This was just a randomly drawn photo of a zebra. Yeah? So in fact, actually a perfectly good output of some of the early GAN tools was just like, I put in a photo of a horse, you know, Monday randomly grabs a photo of a zebra from Google Images and outputs it, says, yeah, there you go, problem solved. Right? And from this, this schematic, that's actually successful, right? Because he drew, drew a real world zebra photo. Yeah? Uh, and, and, and so uh, one way to describe this phenomenon is that there's a mode collapse. In other words, like, there's nothing preventing everything from like, going to the same photograph. So what do you think solves this problem? What can't I do? It's exactly the same thing that came up in this research paper with Danielle on, on surface mapping. It's exactly what we just went through in semi-definite programming. This map has no inverse. Right? So if I take a horse and I draw from it the analogous zebra, well, let's say I also train a tool that takes zebras and dra draws horses. Yeah, this is exactly the same as Danielle's paper. Do you see that? Well, when am I successful? Well, in some sense, in this abstract problem, is successful if I can do that twice and end up where I started again. Yeah, and that's this idea of this, this cycle gap thing. We call this cycle consistent adversarial uh, networks. Yeah, now you guys are caught up with the, the cute terminology here. And actually, it's really, there's no more complicated than that. So you take uh, your old uh, generative adversarial network, and now you make a new generator, which goes from horses to horses, in a very simple fashion. So you go from horses to zebras and back. And now what you do is you penalize any time that thing doesn't look like the identity. It's exactly our objective function that we just talked about in the STP sense. Yeah? And what do you do? Well, this is deep learning, so you just throw it in the pot with everything else. Um, Right, so you have this problem where you have this, this, this particular loss term which really wants you to be able to invert the map that you had. But notice that a map having an inverse does not mean that it's a good map, so you still need that discriminator in there. Right? This is the thing that's telling you if you actually drew zebras or not. Yeah? Uh, and, and, and what you get when you glue all of this stuff together, oh yeah, and you can do the same in the reverse direction. This is just like what, uh, what did Danielle call this? The something splitting? I don't know, whatever. It's all, it's all the same. Yeah? Um, then what you get out is actually a tool that does remarkably, remarkably well uh, for, for these, these uh, generative adversarial things. I'm noticing my slides are out of order, but we'll see some results in just a moment. Um, and this is exactly the same theme that shows up everywhere. I mean, this shows up in shape matching, co-segmentation, structure from motion, um, understanding collections of objects. These are all the same problems. Um, and so, so here's some examples. So here's a horse. Here's its corresponding zebra. Notice the... there's. In some sense, it's extremely impressive. There's also some funny things that happen. Notice, apparently zebras tend to be photographed in a different time of year than horses. That the background actually turns a different color. Um, these are the things that are actually quite hard to co uh, correct from. Now you can go the reverse direction. And, and of course, both maps are learned at the same time. Um, here's an orange. Maybe I want to convert it to an apple. The orange here, the, the little bit kind of persists there. Here's a, another example here. One kind of fun example that actually harkens back to the original kind of image analogies versions of these problems. Like it would be very hard to take the collection of photographs and convert them to a collection of Monet's or whatever, right? And they're certainly not in correspondence. Although there are people that try, right? Because actually Monet specifically often would paint the same scene all, over and over again, right? Like, like there's the, all these cathedrals at different times of day and that, that bridge and so on. And there's some people that have gone back and tried to photograph that so that they have that data set. That seems a little bit like a, a fool's errand to me, but one thing you could do is just download a whole database of, of photos and a whole database of all the things that Monet ever painted 
And now you can use Tokugan to try and convert from photos to Monet's and back. And, and these are remarkably convincing. I don't know if you guys can see. I can turn off the, the lights. It's probably a little better. It's kind of fun to look at. Uh, and you can see here, uh, we can take this collection of photos on the left-hand side. To be fair, the photos are already a little painterly looking, and I wonder if there's a, I wonder how well this works generically speaking, but uh, yeah, you can see that we can convert to Monet, Van Gogh, Cezanne, Ukiyo-e, is that how you say? Um, but in any event, um, I'm sure all of these artists would strongly disagree that these are <laughs> conversions, but they're, they're actually fairly uh, successful. Um, and, and, and there's all kinds of fun things you can do from here, right? So um, there's a little bit of mathematical theory out there that attempts to justify what's going on. Um, there's some notion of entropy of a map, which is thing kind of bounds. I think it's a loose bounds. So I'm not sure I buy this particular theory. The obvious next question you might ask is, well, what if I have more than two modalities? Uh, and what does that look like? It looks exactly the same as the diagrams we just talked about in cycle consistency, right? So what are the two different ways that you could do cycle GANs? Well, one thing you could do is, is do loops between like Monet, Cezanne, and photographs, right? So just do more than one step. That would be what they are calling a cross-domain model. This is kind of nice. I stole, I stole uh, Junyuan's slides and then I realized they exactly follow our, our discussion on, on cycle consistency. Um, or you could map to the ur Monet and then back out. Uh, and indeed, uh, that was proposed in this uh, Stargan uh, piece of research, which is exactly what it sounds like. So they learn like sort of an abstract generator that's sitting in the center of all of your other ones. And then there are these kind of translating things that can go into the different modalities. So there's like one code underlying your object and then a different piece of machinery that converts that code to Monet or Cezanne or whatever. Right? Um, and this allows them to do things like you know, take an image and do black hair, blonde hair, and then gender and age and, and different combinations thereof um, with remarkably creepy uh, <laughs> results. I feel like, it's like there's like a Charlie Sheen scale that goes to the right here. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> um, right. Uh, and, and, and there are many other uh, uh, techniques for doing that. So anyway, that, that concludes our discussion for today. So essentially the point I wanted you guys to get out of this, uh, this quick sort of highlight of, of a very modern research topic is that this is a nice example of cross-pollination between different areas. That this uh, cycle consistency stuff, actually the original history is in math that looks like what we did on the board. And that actually inspired these deep learning tools um, to do some, some really interesting stuff on really messy data. And it's exactly the same insight that generated not only the original paper, but also all the follow-ups. Um, and it's kind of cool to see these, these areas moving in, in lockstep. Okay, uh, so our next lecture has no topic. You guys can suggest topics to me and I'll try to fulfill them, um, but only on the uh, agreement that you show up. So I'll let you think about that. You can vote on Piazza or whatever in the next couple of days so I have some time to actually prepare something to say. Is that fair? Cool, all right, well, I'll see you guys next time. <laughs>